In this course, we'll be called upon to apply many of the undergraduate math concepts that we've learned. And in some cases, like complex numbers and phasors, we may have used those in several other courses, so we may be relatively familiar with them. But in yet other cases, such as vector calculus and series solution of differential equations, this might be the first time we've really had to apply them. So it's appropriate that our first few lectures will be devoted to a mathematical review. Now this being a review, we're not going to derive most of these results. We're just going to state many of them. If you want to, to review the derivations, go back to your undergraduate math text. So we begin with a discussion of complex numbers, which we will use extensively, the related concept of phasors, and the idea of vectors. Complex numbers are built around the idea of the imaginary unit. And we will use the symbol j for the imaginary unit. We will say that j is the square root of minus 1, and that j squared is therefore equal to minus 1. Obviously, a real number squared cannot be negative, so this is a new kind of number. It is, quote, imaginary. Now, once we've defined the imaginary unit, which, by the way, um, in physics and math text, this will typically be represented by the letter I. Engineers use I for many other purposes, and therefore in the engineering literature, usually J is used for the imaginary unit. So we will use J. So once we define the imaginary unit, J, we can now define an arbitrary complex number. So a complex number, Z, will have a real part, X, and then plus J, an imaginary part, Y. And we will write that the real part of z, and we use this operator notation, re, that will pull out the real part, which is x, and the operator im, for imaginary part, will pull out the imaginary part, which is y. We don't include the j there. The y is called the imaginary part, and the j denotes that that's the imaginary part of that number. So if this is a complex number that's composed of two real numbers, x and y, these are both real numbers, one of the things we could do is represent it in a plane with x and y coordinates as a point. A point that, for example, let's say this is x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 2. This would then be the number z is equal to 3 plus j2. Now, if we're going to use this Cartesian plane to represent uh, complex numbers, then there's no reason we need to limit ourselves to Cartesian or rectangular coordinates to represent those points. We could use any other representation, such as polar representation, rho and phi. And so we would write x is equal to rho cosine phi, y is equal to rho sine phi. That's, those are just uh, polar coordinates. And so th that gives us two different representations of this complex number. So if we put z back together using this representation, well, they're going to have a common factor of rho, so we'll factor that out, and that'll leave then cosine of phi plus j sine of phi. Now, this quantity here, cosine of phi plus j sine of phi, we're going to represent by e to the j phi. And this is called Euler's formula. Now, that's not an arbitrary definition. In fact, if you look at the uh, power series of e to the z, and then you allow z to be j phi, and you work it out, and everywhere you see a j squared, you replace it by minus 1, 
that power series will indeed break up into a real part, which is the power series for the cosine, and an imaginary part with a J factor, which is the power series for the sine. So this is mathematically rigorous. So e to the j phi means cosine of phi plus j sine of phi, if you actually want to calculate it. And with that, we can then say z is equal to either the rectangular format, x plus jy, or the polar format, rho e to the j phi. That's just two different ways to represent a complex number. Now let's look at this expression, e to the j phi is equal to the cosine of phi plus j sine of phi. This is Euler's formula. What is e to the minus j phi? Let's so replace phi by minus phi. Well, what is the cosine of minus phi? The cosine is an even function, and therefore cosine of minus phi is the same as cosine of phi. But the sine is an odd function. Sine of minus phi is minus the sine of phi. So we get minus j sine of phi. Now, let's add these together. e to the j phi plus e to the minus j phi and divide by 2. So we're going to add these two expressions together. So we got cosine of phi plus cosine of phi. That's 2 cosine of phi divided by 2. That's cosine of phi. And then we've got j sine of phi minus j sine of phi. Well, those cancel out. So we just get cosine of phi. So this is a representation of the cosine function in terms of these complex exponentials. Likewise, if we take e to the j phi minus e to the minus j phi, and now we'll divide by 2j, what are we going to get? Well, let's see. We'll get cosine of phi minus cosine of phi, because for phi is equal to minus phi, cosine of minus phi is equal to cosine of phi. So the real parts cancel out. But then for the imaginary parts, we'll get here, e to the j phi, we'll get j sine of phi minus the imaginary part of this expression. So we'll get minus minus j sine of phi. That'll be 2j sine of phi divided by 2j. That's just the sine of phi. So we have now representations of the trig functions, cosine and sine, in terms of these complex exponentials. And we'll use those extensively in this course. Another thing, of course, that we can write is if we have complex number z is equal to rho e to the j phi, then we know that the real part of that real part of z will be rho times the cosine of phi. So we can extract a cosine with this real operation applied to a complex number. We'll use also the notation that for a complex number in this format, we'll say that rho is the magnitude, sometimes called the modulus, of the complex number. We'll use the absolute value signs to represent that. And phi is called the argument of the complex number. And as a shorthand, using these ideas, we'll sometimes write the z would be equal to rho at an angle of phi. And this is just a shorthand for rho e to the j phi. In fact, even some calculators will allow this type of notation for complex numbers. Now up here, where we changed the sine of phi, we saw what happened was the real part stayed the same, but the imaginary part flipped its sign, went from positive to negative on the, on the sign there. And in general, we'll talk about the, well, let's call it the rigorous here, it's the complex conjugate. The complex conjugate of a number will be represented by putting a little asterisk above it like this. What does that mean? That means that you negate 
the imaginary part. Or more generally, anywhere you see a j, just replace it with minus j. So x plus jy becomes x minus jy. Rho e to the j phi becomes rho e to the minus j phi. So that is the conjugation operation. Algebraic operations on complex numbers uh, follow standard algebraic rules. And whenever we see j squared, we can replace it by minus 1. So suppose we have, uh, well, let's, let's call it z is x plus jy is one complex number. And w is u plus jv is a second complex number. And let's look at addition and subtraction. So z plus w would be, so add this expression plus that expression. I'm going to group together the real parts, x plus u, and the imaginary parts have a common factor of j, and that would then be y plus v. And if we wanted to do the difference, well, these would just be differences. So the sum and difference of complex numbers, the real part is the sum and difference of the real parts, and the imaginary part is the sum and difference of the imaginary parts. Very straightforward. As a special case, what if w was the conjugate of z? So z plus or minus z conjugate. So this would be, right, so the real part of z conjugate is just x, so this would be x plus or minus x, plus j. And the imaginary part of z conjugate would be minus y. We negate the imaginary part, or equivalently, we replace j by minus j. So this would become y plus or minus minus y, which is the same as y minus or plus y. So if we were doing the sum, this would be x plus x is 2x. y minus y is 0. So that's for the sum. If we are doing the difference, this would be x minus x is 0 plus j. y plus j is 2y. j, 2y for the difference. So if you add a complex number to its conjugate, you get 2 times the real part. If you subtract the conjugate from a complex number, you get j times 2 times the imaginary part. Let's look at multiplication, z times w. Okay, so here's z is x plus jy times u plus jv. And we simply just work out the four different terms there. Let's uh, take x times u as one term. Let's look at then jy times jv. Well, that's got a j squared in it, so that's a minus 1 yv. So minus yv. And then the other two terms have one factor of j, jyu and jxv. So jyu and jxv. So there is the product of two complex numbers in terms of rectangular coordinates. In polar notation, this would look like the following. Magnitude of z, e to the j, argument of z, times the magnitude of w, e to the j, argument of w, which then we can group together magnitude of z and magnitude of w. And when you multiply exponentials, you add their exponents. So then this is e to the j arg z plus arg w. So multiplication is simpler when you're using the polar notation because you simply multiply the magnitudes and add 
the arguments. As a special case, if we're looking at z times z conjugate, well, let's work this out both ways. Well, let's see, this would be x plus jy times x minus jy. So the real part would be x times x is x squared, and then we got a j times minus j, so j squared is minus 1, so we got a minus minus 1 is plus 1 times y squared. So we get x squared plus y squared, and then the cross terms, x, j, y, and minus j, y, x, those cancel out. So z times z conjugate is x squared plus y squared. Or if we use the polar notation, it would be the magnitude of z times the magnitude of z conjugate. The magnitude of z conjugate is the same as the magnitude of z, right? Because magnitude of rho e to the j phi is equal to magnitude of rho e to the minus j phi is equal to, oops, is equal to rho. So in the polar format, this would just be the magnitude of z times itself, magnitude of z squared, and then you have the argument of z plus the argument of z conjugate. Well, the argument of z conjugate is the negative of the argument of z, so you'd have e to the j zero is one. And so you would just get, this would be just the magnitude of z squared. And of course, from the equality of those two, we can say the magnitude of z squared is the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. And therefore, the magnitude of z is the square root of that. Now let's look at division. Z over W would be X plus JY over U plus JV. And we usually like to break things up into real and imaginary parts. So to do that, we could multiply the top and bottom numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator, U minus JV over U minus JV. That's of course just multiplying the whole thing by one. But the nice thing about that is that the denominator becomes then real because it's a complex number times its conjugate. So that's just one over, as we already know, u squared plus v squared. And then the product of the numerators, well, we have x times u. Oops. x times u. And then j times minus j is minus minus one is one y times v, so plus y times v, and then we would have some j terms. We'd have j, y, u, so j, y, u, and then we'd have minus j, v, x, so minus x, v, and we'll write this then as x, u, plus y, v, as the real part, plus j, y, u, minus x, v, is the imaginary part when it's divided by u squared plus v squared. So that would break it up into the real and imaginary parts. Just as for multiplication, it's, this is much more conveniently done in polar format, because then z over w is magnitude of z, e to the j argument of z over the magnitude of w e to the j argument of w and that is simply the ratio of the magnitude of z to the magnitude of w times e and when you divide uh, complex exponentials or exponentials in general you subtract their exponents so this would be e to the j arg z minus arg w. Now let's point out that uh, the complex number can be the argument of the exponential. We can say e to the z. What is this? Well, this would be e to the x plus jy. 
And we can break that up as e to the x times e to the jy, which of course then would be using Euler's formula, e to the x times cosine of y plus j times a sine of y. And if we take a product of two complex exponentials, e to the z, e to the w, well, this is just e to the z plus w, and that simply breaks up as e to the x plus u, e to the j, y plus v. The Fourier transform of a function f of t is big F of omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity f of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And the inverse Fourier transform is that little f is then equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity big F of omega e to the plus j omega t d omega over 2 pi. I like to write the 2 pi with the d omega. Some people put it out in front, uh, but in this form it reminds me that Omega is the radian frequency, and omega over 2 pi is a hertz frequency. So this is the differential of hertz frequency. Anyway, in the inverse Fourier transform form here, this shows that any signal of time can be represented as a superposition of complex exponentials. That's going to be very, very convenient for us. Big F of omega is, we sometimes call that the spectrum of the signal. Now, that ties in with complex numbers and with the idea of a phaser. If we have a signal, V at T, which is, say, Vm, maximum, if this is a voltage, the maximum voltage, cosine omega T plus phi. So this is a general sinusoid at frequency omega with a phase V and a magnitude Vm. Well, we can write that as the real part of Vm e to the j omega t plus phi. That's just using Euler's formula. Right, the real part is the cosine, the imaginary part is the sine. And now I'm going to just rearrange things a little bit. I'm going to put the Vm together with e to the j phi, and then that all times e to the j omega t. And then this here is a complex number v, which we'll call a phaser. It gives me, the in one complex number, the magnitude of a sinusoid, Vm, and the phase, e to the j phi. And if I have then that phaser representing V at T, that tells me everything I need to know, if I, assuming that I know what the frequency is. Because in order to get V at T, all I need to do is take that phaser, multiply it by E to the J omega T, take the real part. All right, so V at T is the real part of the phaser times E to the J omega T. We'll use this extensively throughout this course. We'll, for the most part, solve for electric and magnetic fields as vector phasers. And so we won't even have to worry about the time dependence. That'll always be understood. If we ever need to actually get the actual time dependence of the field, we just multiply by e to the j omega t and take the real part. And looking up here, you can see there will be kind of a similar idea going on with the inverse Fourier transform. So if we have a signal now that is not a single sinusoid, 
but a superposition of sinusoids at all possible frequencies, well, that's what this represents. So there's a close connection between the idea of the Fourier transform, complex numbers, and the idea of a phaser. So this would then could lead to, if we had a signal that was not just at a single frequency, instead of saying it had just a phaser, we could then say, well, it has a phaser, which is a function of frequency. So for at all possible frequencies, it has a particular phaser component. And for each of those frequency components, we just multiply by e to the j omega t, take the real part. And to get the entire signal, we just do like in the inverse Fourier transform here, just take the superposition, just sum those all up. Well, that's a very, very uh, fundamental concept that we'll use throughout the course. A single number, like say the phaser V, we'll call a scalar. If we have something that has not only a magnitude, like a scalar, but also a direction in space, we'll write... And normally in typesetting this, we would make this a boldface A, say. So I'm going to underscore it to represent an A. Some people put an arrow above it. This is a thing that has multiple components. In three-dimensional space, it would have the three components in, say, the X, Y, and Z directions. And we could represent it in three-dimensional space by, here's X, Y, and Z. Um, I say that's the vector A. Here is the X component, the Y component, and the Z component. These are the projections onto the X, Y, and Z axes of this vector. So a vector has both a magnitude, which should be like the length of the vector here, Although it's important to remember that in many cases, these vectors will not have units of length. They might have units of volts per meter for electric field or something like that. So when we say the magnitude, we can think of it as an abstract length, but it's not literally a, a number of meters. So it has a magnitude, but also a direction in space. All right, so there'd be, you could define angles with respect to the various uh, coordinate axes, and so orient that in space. So the magnitude which loosely we can think of as the length, it's only a length if this is this has units of meters, will represent as this notation, also called the norm, by the way, uh, like a double absolute value sign. And that's given by, in rectangular coordinates, the Pythagorean theorem. It's the square root of the magnitude of AX squared. So we are allowing for this to be a complex vector. So the elements, the components, are complex numbers. So to do the, the actual magnitude, we need to take the absolute value. So absolute value of AX squared plus absolute value of AY squared plus the absolute value of a c squared, square root of all that. That's the magnitude. And we'll often use the notation that the, the magnitude of a vector, we'll just represent it by a non-boldface or italic letter uh, with the same name as the vector. So one of the most important vectors is the position vector, R, which in x, y, and z coordinates is just x, y, and z. And in that case, R would be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared would literally be the distance from the origin to the point at the end of the vector to the, to the position in space. Adding or subtracting vectors involves just adding or subtracting their components. So vector A plus or minus vector B you would just 
add and subtract each of the components, AX plus or minus BX, AY plus or minus BY, and AZ plus or minus BZ. Geometrically, if I have a, a vector A here, and I have another vector B, then A plus B, well, I just take B, and let's call this uh, the, the tip of the arrow here, we'll call the tip of the vector, and the other point we'll call the base. So you take the base of B and put it at the tip of A, and then the vector that points from the base of A to the tip of B is that sum. And let me make that a little clearer here. This is A, and this is the sum A plus B, and those are all bold face. Now to subtract, we just say A plus minus B, and so we minus B would just be B flipped around, and then this here would be A minus B. So addition and subtraction of vectors. If we multiply a vector times a scalar, so like K times A, we simply multiply each one of the components. KAX plus KAY, sorry, uh, KAX, KAY, KAZ. So that's a scalar times a vector. The idea of a unit vector is very useful. And we form a unit vector simply by taking a vector and dividing it by its length or norm. And we'll use the notation a hat sub the name of the vector, and that'll represent a unit vector. If we turn that around, then we can represent a vector as a unit vector times a norm or a length. So the unit vector itself we can think of as a pure representation of direction in space, and then the norm as the magnitude or the length, let's just call that length in quotes because it may not be a physical length. The most useful unit vectors of all are the coordinate unit vectors. So in rectangular coordinates, AX would be the vector 1, 0, 0. And so this would be a unit vector in the X direction. Then we could have a unit vector in the Y direction, a Y hat, which would be 0, 1, 0 and then a unit vector in the z direction. A z hat, which is zero, zero, one. And with that notation, we can then represent an arbitrary vector A as a superposition of these unit vectors. A x hat times the x component of A, plus a y hat times the y component of a plus a z hat times the z component of a. Now, we might also write that as just the triple of numbers a x, a y, and a z. So these are alternate representations of a vector in rectangular coordinates. But we usually limit the interpretation of a triple of numbers like this to be specifically in rectangular coordinates, whereas this notation can be generalized to an arbitrary coordinate system. So if we were in spherical coordinates, this then could be like the a hat r vector, this would be the a hat theta vector, and the a hat phi vector, for example. So this is a much more general representation. And it allows us also to very clearly break up when we do complicated operations on vectors, 
it'll break it up into three different operations on these particular unit vectors. There are two useful ways to form products between vectors. One is called the dot product, also called the inner product or scalar product. And in this case, if we have, say, two vectors A and B with rectangular coordinates AX, AY, AZ, etc., then the dot product is AX, BX plus AY, BY plus AZ, BZ. And the geometric significance of this is that if, say, this is vector A, and this is vector B, each of which have direction and magnitude, and the angle between them is theta AB, then A dot B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them, cosine theta AB. So two important special cases would be of theta AB is equal to zero, so the two vectors are in the same direction, then A dot B is simply the product of their magnitudes. On the other hand, if theta AB is 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, then A dot B is equal to zero because the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. And in that case, this is a right angle there, we say the vectors are orthogonal at right angles to each other. So the first case here, theta AB is equal to zero, the vectors are parallel, and yeah, theta AB equal 90 degrees. The vectors are orthogonal. A special case of this would be where instead of the vector A, we have a unit vector. So we might have, say, a unit vector here, A hat sub A, unit vector in the direction of vector big A, and here is the vector B. And in that case, a hat a dot b would be equal to, well, the length of the unit vector is 1, so this would just be equal to the length b times the cosine of theta. Well, this length of this vector here, that's the magnitude of b, and then the co cosine of theta times b would be then this projected length projected on to the direction a hat a. So then this would give you, we might say, the projection or the component of b in the direction of the unit vector. So that's a very useful operation. And it's one which allows us then to grab the coordinates. If we have a vector, we can just take the dot product with the various uh, unit vectors, coordinate unit vectors, and get then the coordinate components of that vector. Another useful way to form a product between two vectors is the so-called cross product, or also called the vector product. And as the name implies, the vector product produces a vector. So we might write that C is equal to A cross B. And in terms of the components of A in rectangular coordinates, this is uh, the X component. So A hat X 
will be a y b z minus a z b y and the a hat y component will be a z b x minus a x b z and then the a hat z component will be a x b y minus a y x so notice written out in this form where the th these three different components are stacked on top of each other notice the cycling through the subscripts here x y z here y z x z x y and so on so cyclical cycling through the subscripts the length or norm of the cross product is the product of the magnitudes times the sine of the angle between the vectors. So here, let's say this is our vector A. This is, let me make that a little more acute there. There's our vector B. They have an angle theta AB between them. Then the cross product turns out to be then a vector C, which is the cross product, which is perpendicular or orthogonal to both A and B and has a length, which is magnitude A, magnitude B times the sine theta AB. So the cross product C, which is a cross B has the property that C dot A, the dot or inner product between C and A is equal to zero, as is the inner product between C and B. So there are only two directions in space that are going to be perpendicular to two arbitrary vectors. And the one that corresponds to this cross product is the one that has a right-hand rotation sense with respect to A and B. So imagine putting your right fingers in the direction of A and then sweeping your fingers toward B. Then your thumb would point in the direction of the cross product. And the length of the cross product is proportional to the sine of the angle between them. Obviously, then, if theta AB is equal to zero or 180 degrees or zero in pi radians then a cross b is equal to zero the cross product between parallel or anti-parallel vectors is zero otherwise if they're not parallel or anti-parallel they'll have a non-zero cross product and this is very important for example in things like torques computing torques and forces and um, and, and we'll see, especially the magnetic force on moving charges will involve the cross product. So we have dot products and cross products as two very important ways to form products between vectors. An application of dot products and cross products arises when we have a surface in which we often will uh, when we look at boundary conditions, for example, of electromagnetic fields. And that surface is defined by some surface normal, A sub n hat. This is the normal to the surface. And then we have a vector A. And we want to break this vector up into two components one that is normal to the surface plus one that is tangential so this will be the normal component so perpendicular to the surface and this will be the tangential component parallel to the surface so the way we do that is here's our a let me draw it this way 
what we want to do is represent A as a sum of a tangential component and a normal component. And then that's A. And the normal component is parallel to the surface normal. The tangential component is perpendicular. So to get the normal component, well, we want to just get the component of A in the direction of the unit normal vector. And so AN will be, well, we'll take the dot product between the surface normal and the vector A, and that'll give us the magnitude of the projection of A onto that direction. And then we recover the direction by just multiplying again by a and hat. So there's the normal component. A and hat times the dot product, A and hat dot A. And then the tangential component, well, one way we could represent that would just be to take A and subtract the normal component, and of course what's left over is the tangential component. But another way to get this is to take the following product, a double cross product. A and hat cross A cross A and hat. Now, if we go back here and look at um, this angle between the surface normal and the vector A, call that theta, then we know that the dot product is going to be proportional to the cosine of theta and the cross product will be proportional to the sine of theta. So we get the cosine and the sine components, the lengths, and then this extra cross product here just reorients this component so it lies in the proper direction because we would get A cross A and hat, right, would be a vector that would point out here. So this would be A cross A and hat would be a vector perpendicular to the plane of a and hat and a and then we do another cross product with a and hat cross that and then that gets us back in the direction of the tangential vector okay. so if you already know the surface normal component of a this is the easiest way to get the tangential component but if you want to get the tangential component directly then you do this double cross product In a course on electromagnetics, we're going to spend most of our time worrying about electric and magnetic fields. So what do we mean when we say something is a field? Let's start off with the idea of a scalar field. So a scalar field we can think of as just a function, say, of vector position, f of r. Uh, right, which in rectangular coordinates would be f of x, y, and z. So it's just a function of position in this case. You could also have time dependence in there also. If this was a real function, we might just leave it written uh, like that, but it could also be a complex function of position, in which case we might break it up as a real part plus j times an imaginary part. So that would be, then we might call that a complex scalar field. And a complex number, we know, can also serve as a phasor. So this complex scalar field might be the phasor of some uh, real field that also varies with time. So it might be the case where then f of r and t might be the written be able to be written as the real part of this complex phasor field f of r times e to the j omega t using the phasor concept so in this case we might instead call this a scalar phasor field and then, especially when we're talking about uh, electric and magnetic fields, we're going to 
usually be talking about vector fields. So a vector field could be something like vector a as a function of vector position r, and this would have, say, x, y, and z components. So it might be a hat x times ax of x, y, and z plus a hat y times a y of x, y, and z plus a hat z times a z of x, y, and z. So at every point x, y, and z in space, we have the three components of this vector field, ax, ay, and az. And those could be real functions, so the actual real electric and magnetic fields would be real valued uh, fields, but they would also be functions of, of time. And we might then use the phasor concept to represent those so that this field here would be a complex vector field, or we're going to use it as a, a phasor, so we might call it a vector phasor field. Meaning that to get the actual, let's call it a real of position and time, we would take the real part of this vector phasor field, A of R, these complex values, um, three complex values, the X, Y, Z components at every point in space, times a time dependence, E to the J omega T. And in fact, that's what we're going to primarily do in this course. This is, this is our bread and butter right here. So we'll use this idea extensively. As a basic example, we might have, say, a real valued vector field as a function of position and time which is, say, the real part of, let's give it just an x co component, ax hat, a0, e to the j, phi, e to the minus j, beta z, e to the j, omega t. And pulling out the real part of that, you get a hat x, a0 here, then this is going to be, well, the real part of this will be a, a cosine omega t minus beta z plus phi. And that would, we'll see, it describes a plane wave that moves along the z-axis uh, with a frequency omega and an arbitrary Amplitude A0 and phase phi. So now let's look at a very important problem that we'll use when we try to quantify how electromagnetic fields propagate energy and power through space. We need to, in those cases, often calculate a time average dot product. So suppose at one point in space we have a vector A which has an X component AX cosine omega T plus VX. So that's an arbitrary sinusoidal function at frequency omega. And then the Y component is AY cosine omega t plus phi y. The z component is a z cosine omega t plus phi z. And then we have a second vector, also sinusoidal at frequency omega, vector b, bx, cosine omega t plus theta x, 
dy cosine omega t plus theta y bz cosine omega t plus theta z. These are the both completely general sinusoidal vectors oscillating at a frequency omega. And then we take the dot product, a dot b. So what are we going to get? Let's see. Well, the x component will be ax bx, first cosine, cosine omega t plus vx times cosine omega t plus theta x, and then the y and z versions of those. And we want to do a time average, so we'll use these angled brackets to represent a time average. So let's use a trig identity that says cosine of A times cosine of B is one half the cosine A minus B plus one half the cosine of A plus B. So if we apply that up here to a, the a dot b, and we're going to do the time average, we're going to get, well, let's see, let's write it this way. We'll have ax bx, and then a factor of a half. So one half ax bx, cosine of the difference of the argument. So the omega t's will cancel. We'll get phi x minus theta x, so cosine bx minus theta x plus the cosine of the sum. Omega t plus itself will be 2 omega t and then plus phi x plus theta x and then the y and z components and this will be time averaged. Well, the first term is easy because it's a constant. And so we'll just have one half ax bx cosine bx minus theta x. The second term is sinusoidal at frequency 2 omega. A sinusoidal function time averages to zero because it's equally positive and negative. So that will go away. And then you can see what will happen for the y and the z. You'll just get similar things with the different subscripts. So we'll have then one half a y b y cosine b y minus theta y plus one half a z b z cosine phi z minus theta z. And what we want to do now is to represent this expression in terms of the vector phasors that represent the sinusoidally oscillating fields. Suppose we represent our sinusoidal oscillating vectors as phasors. A, we'll write as Ax e to the j phi x. Ay e to the j phi y. Az e to the j phi z. And B will be Bx e to the j theta x. Dy e to the j theta y bz e to the j theta c. If we multiply these by e, both of these by e to the j omega t and take the real part, we get the, the vectors that we had on the previous board. Now, consider 
one half the real part of a dot b conjugate. What's that going to look like? Let's see. One half. Let's do the first uh, part of the dot product here. This, this term times the conjugate over here. Well, if we conjugate this, that just puts a minus sign in front of the j. So that'll be one half the real part of, here you'll have ax and here you'll have bx. Here you have e to the j phi x and here e to the minus j th theta x. That'll be e to the j phi x minus theta x plus, and we'll get likewise for the y and the z components. Oops. E to the j phi y minus theta y and then plus a z b z e to the j b z minus theta z and what will that be well the real part of e to the j theta is just cosine of theta so this will be then one half a x b x cosine v x minus theta x plus a y b y cosine of phi y minus theta y plus a z b z cosine of phi z minus theta z which is exactly what we wanted to get the time average of the original time varying fields a and b we take the dot product of those and the time average so what this tells us is if we come across an expression that looks like one half the real part of one the vector phase or dot the conjugate of another. It is the time, we know that that is going to be the time average of A of R and T dot B of r and t time averaged okay so we'll make good use of that later in the course another important operation we will perform with vector fields is the situation where we have some path let's call it l and Everywhere in space, we have the vector field A. And at every point on this path, we can define a little displacement dl. And we want to calculate the integral along that path of A dot dl. So we can think of dl here as in the x direction, a component dx. In the y direction, a component dy, and in the z direction, a component dz. Then this line integral could be written as integral along the path of ax dx plus integral along the path of a y dy plus the integral along the path of a z dz. And an important special case is where that path is a closed path. So maybe it does something like this, loops around. And then we write the line integral with a little circle around the integral sign 
a dot dl. So those are line integrals. Another important operation will be the case where suppose we have a surface S and everywhere in space there is a vector field A defined and we imagine it penetrating the surface and we consider a little patch on that surface which we represent by a little element of surface area ds. So ds, the vector ds, would be in the direction of the surface normal and with an area ds, whatever the little area of that patch is. Then we can define a surface integral say the integral over the surface S, the integral over the surface S of A dot dS. So this will be really important when we talk about things like electric and magnetic flux through some surface. And an important special case would be where it's, we have a closed surface So, for example, maybe we have a sphere, and we go through and do the integral over that closed surface, then we use the notation similar to the line integral. We put a circle around there to represent a closed surface. Integral of a dot ds over a closed surface. And finally, In the region inside a closed surface of some volume, we could define a volume integral. So we might represent a triple integral over the three dimensions of space of, say, some function f of r dv. So line, surface, and volume integrals will have lots of applications for us.